Hey everybody, how you doing? Thanks for joining me here. In this video, we are going to take a look at branch circuit requirements specifically for asynchronous motor. Last video, we took a look at a wound rotor motor. This video, we're gonna see how does it change when we use that synchronous motor, specifically around using that table 44 in the back of the code there, as well as just some of those regular branch circuit requirements. Let's get to it. So if you are familiar with motor branch circuit calculations, then there's not too much different as far as synchronous motors are concerned. Again, the point of focus in this video is really going to be utilizing that table 44 to determine what the proper FLA for this installation would be. Now again, as always, if you check the notes in table 44, it tells us very specifically, if we're given an FLA, that's what we're going to take with us and use in our calculations. But we're permitted, if we don't have an FLA, to use the rated horsepower of the motor and table 44 to kind of get started with things. So if you look at our example here, we have a synchronous motor. I've got a little nameplate just kind of whipped up here and notice that full load current area, somebody scratched it out, right? So we don't have that to rely on. We are permitted at this point now to go to table 44 and utilize that. Now at table 44, we have our normal squirrel cage induction motors on the left hand side, but over on the far right hand side, there's a few columns there specifically for synchronous motors. And if you look up at the top, it says synchronous motors at a unit power factor. Now if this was a synchronous motor with a unity power factor, we could just take our horsepower and our rated voltage, our nominal voltage with the corresponding column, and we could just pick an FLA based straight off of that. But if you look at the nameplate value here, our nameplate states that this is a synchronous motor with an 80% power factor. Now, it doesn't mention anything specifically right in the table, but again, if you go down to the notes, I believe it's note three, if you look, it says for corresponding power factors of 90% and 80%, we're going to use a multiplier of 1.1 and 1.25 respectively. So because we're operating at an 80% power factor with this synchronous motor, we're gonna use a multiplier with 1.25 once we find that table 44 value. So cross-referencing voltage, horsepower, we find out that normally with this unity power factor, we'd be looking at 86 amps as an FLA, but because it's a 80% power factor, we're gonna use that times 1.25 to determine what our actual FLA is that we're gonna use in this question. So fire that into the calculator, we find out our FLA in this example is going to be 107.5 amps. That's our magic number for our motor calculation. We're gonna use that for all of our different calculations, our overloads, we're gonna use that for our branch circuit conductors, our motor supply conductors, and eventually as well, our overcurrent protection. So let's start off with our branch circuit conductors. Again, I'm just gonna highlight these individual sections just so that we have points of reference here. There's our overloads, which we're gonna calculate as well. And we'll take a look at those branch circuit motor supply conductors. And then finally, like I say, we'll finish off with these overcurrents or this overcurrent. In this example, we're using a non-time delay fuse. So eventually when we go to table 29, that's what we're gonna use with reference to that table 29. So for the duty cycle in this motor, we're actually gonna use intermittent duty. And we're gonna say that it's operating for a five minute time period. Because this is now classified as a non-continuous duty motor, we're going to use 28106 sub rule 2 now, which tells me to obtain that multiplying factor to get that minimum ampacity for our branch circuit conductors, we're going to go table 27, which actually tells me we have a multiplying factor. It tells me 85% right? I don't have to use that full FLA. I'm permitted to use 85% of that FLA because really this motor is not running for very long periods of time and it's an intermittent duty motor. So it's built for at least that five minute. It can easily handle that five minute loading. So starting off with that 107.5 amps as our FLA times 0.85 we get a minimum ampacity for our branch circuit conductors of 91.35 amps. And we're gonna take that to table two. Because it says up at the top that our equipment termination temperatures are 90 degrees, 
I'm going to use the 90 degree column when I go to table 2, which should yield a number 4. And that number 4 has an allowable or an ampacity of 95 amps. That'll safely handle that 107.5 amps at that 85%. So that's our branch circuit conductor. We're going to use the same calculation when we go for these motor supply conductors, but again, there's one little trick, and this isn't specific to synchronous motors, this is with motor supply conductors in general. We have to keep in mind 28104 when we're deciding what size conductor we're going to buy. Right? So we're still going to use the same calculated values from 28106 sub rule 2 and table 27. We're still going to use that 107.5 times 0.85 to get that minimum ampacity of 91.35. But here's where it changes. When I go table two, it tells me in 28104, I need to select my motor supply conductor from the 75 degree column in table two. Again, the th reason that we're doing this is this motor is gonna get warm. There's gonna be some heat kicking off of this. We want a slightly larger conductor than our branch circuit conductors because they're gonna kinda act like heat sinks before that motor heat can conduct back through to our overloads and maybe nuisance trip or overloads, right? So we use a 75 degree column for those motor supply conductors and it actually ends up yielding in this case a number three. That is good for 100 amps, which makes sense. We see a slightly larger conductor on that motor supply again. Think of it acting like a heat sink, right? So again, that's not specific to synchronous motors. That's just motor supply conductors in general. Always pay attention to that 75 degree note. Unless it's a class A motor and we're using 90 degree insulation temperatures as it notes in 28104 sub rule 3, right? So overloads, nothing changes there. We're still going to refer to 28306. And it tells me for 1.15 or greater, I'm going to use 125%. In our example here, we have a service factor listed on our nameplate of 1.1. So for less than 1.15, we're going to use 115% as our multiplier. Times that good old FLA of 107.5 to get a maximum trip setting on that overload of 123.625 amps. So again, if you could dial that up, that's the maximum you would be able to dial that up to for that overload according to 28306. All right, so our overcurrent device, again, nothing changes as far as the calculation. We're still gonna refer to that 28200. Sub rule three, which tells me go to table 29. And you'll notice for synchronous motors, it's under the same row as squirrel cage induction motors, but since we're using a non-time delay fuse in this example, we actually get a multiplier of 300%. And it tells me in 28200, I cannot exceed that table 29 value multiplied by my FLA. So in this case, we're just gonna run the numbers. We're looking at 107.5 amp FLA times three gives me a maximum calculated value or a maximum calculated trip setting of 322.5 amps. I cannot exceed this. I have to go to table 13 if I'm selecting an overcurrent device. And because I cannot exceed this, there's nothing, there is no 322.5. If there was, great, I could buy that one. But it doesn't exist on table 13, so I have to go down. I go down at table 13 and I select a 300 amp OC. That would be the max size device that I can put on that branch circuit to protect that synchronous motor. So hopefully this has helped with that synchronous motors again. A lot of the concepts that we discussed in this video are specific, or sorry, not specific to synchronous motors. They apply to any really branch circuit calculation for a motor. The only thing that was specific was when we found that FLA uh, based off table 44. So watch out for that one. That one can kind of catch you off guard if you're looking at it in an exam question or something. Make sure you're going to the right spot for that synchronous motor FLA. But thanks for watching. Again, feel free, hit that like, hit that subscribe. Again, we're going to continue coming out with some of these motor branch circuit calculations uh, in the next video. I think we're going to take a look at those, why delta starts, how it affects those individual overloads, also conductors, things like that. We'll have a little discussion about that. So we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.